right now on Higher Journeys with Alexis Brooks. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Higher Journeys. And of course, if it's your first time here, welcome. The conversation that you're about to hear between myself and a guest that I have been wanting to have on this show for so long is, I, if it does not intrigue you, I don't know what will. I'm talking about Anthony Peake, well-known author and researcher in the consciousness movement, I should say. He's been at this for a very long time. He is an esteemed, best-selling author, a UK-based uh, researcher, and uh, quite the philosopher, I would say, life philosopher, spiritual philosopher. Anthony and I just launched into a conversation uh, that as per usual, I didn't expect, you know, I always say prior to going on the air with my guest, dearest, dearest, greatest spirit, let this conversation go where it needs to go for the highest good of all involved. And I've got to tell you, if this was not for the highest good of all of us, given what we're going through right now, particularly, I don't know what is, you are going to, I guarantee, thoroughly enjoy this very brief, but very powerful exchange between myself and Anthony. Anthony uh, is uh, the author of 11 books, but his most recent book was the impetus for how we came together, uh, his book, The Hidden Universe, which is a stunning, stunning read. But I have to tell you, we, we didn't get to too much of what the book is about. And yet, the overall theme of this book was brought out within the context of the conversation that you're about to hear. And like I said, it it was quite powerful. We're going to be having Anthony back because there's just so much more to, to delve into. I know you're not going to, uh, you're going to want to hear much more from him as we go forward here on this, uh, this channel of higher journeys. But without further ado, I want you to listen to the conversation between myself and Anthony. And yes, it does have to do with what we're going through right now. But in a way, I doubt you've yet uh, to hear. So without further ado, let's get into the show. Anthony, I have been an admirer of your work for so long. I have to say your determination and your tenacity when it comes to investigating the true nature of reality, which includes the enigmatic, I would say, that undergirds all of reality and your approach to this investigation to me is second to none. I know you've been at this for a long time, this sort of exploration uh, that's been a lifelong passion for you. I love a line from your bio where it says, Yours has been a voracious and unquenchable need to know everything about everything. And I would say, indeed. Now, in your most recent book, The Hidden Universe, an investigation into non-human intelligence, this determination of yours to go even deeper into the underbelly of reality is clear and unequivocal. And this is what we're going to be discussing today. But first, please allow me to welcome you finally to Higher Journeys for the first time. Welcome, Anthony. Oh, wonderful to chat to you. No, it's, I've been looking forward to it as well, and it's good. Thank it's good. You. Great. And I'm glad you're doing well over in the UK today. That's, that's the important thing. Now, listen, Anthony, you and I agreed that the focus of this chat would be on this amazing work of yours, A Hidden Universe, and as it should be, given all of the extraordinary information you've been uh, able to unearth to develop what I would say is a very cogent hypothesis of the otherwise unknown. But before we dive into this, given all that's going on right now, I would be remiss if I didn't first get your way in on the significance of this event uh, that we're going through, this new world we've all been dealt on some level, particularly mm -hmm. when it comes to the possible metaphysical underpinnings of what's going on. So let me ask you this way. At some, lo at some level, could this event of ours have emerged from what you call the hidden universe? I, uh, it's possible. It's possible. One of the things that... When I was writing the book, um, I had so many areas I could have followed up on, and I had the difficulty of having to take certain areas out. And one of the areas I was going to be looking into was the mystery of DNA, how DNA has evolved, and the role of DNA. Now, what is particularly intriguing about viruses is that viruses have their own peculiar form of DNA and evolve incredibly quickly, and they seem to be almost like DNA in action. So that would have been a section I'd have been looking at because I think that there is a driving force within the universe. What that driving force is, I'm not entirely sure, but I have certain ideas where I think that's going. Now, in terms of the whole COVID-19, as we were talking off camera before, when we were first starting the interview, I have had, as have my little group over here in the UK, 
this curious feeling about 2020. Mm. And it's not just because it, it, the numbers seem to make sense. We've all got this feeling that there's going to be a radical change. And indeed, towards the end of last year, we were discussing this. And I would argue that the reason we have this sensation is, and again, if anybody's read my book, um, uh, my very first book, Is There Life After Death? The Extraordinary Science of What Happens When We Die, and its sequel, The Dame and a Guide to Your Extraordinary oh. Secret Self, oh. I state uh, a fairly logical synopsis of the idea that we are living, not only are we living in a simulation, ah. I love it. But we are living our lives again within the simulation in the same way as a an individual plays a computer game over and over again. Effectively, the Russian edition of my first book was called Groundhog Life, uh, based on Ground, Groundhog Day, the movie. Yes. And if this is the case, and we have all, all, the, all of us that experience deja vu have experienced this life before um, in many different iterations, effectively, we will all have remembered this particular event hmm. because we would but not only this why this event is so cataclysmic is that however effective your daemon is which is your game player in my scenario hmm. however effective your dame player is your game player could not engineer a circumstance where you could avoid it because it's worldwide and it is the first time in the history of humanity really that there has been something like this that there's no escape from right and it's affecting everybody and it's affecting everybody in a powerful way so we all remember this in sub subliminal way we all remember it and how it's going to pan out is utterly intriguing because what i'm noticing is that people are becoming more caring of each other there seems to be a, a burgeoning spirituality taking place because of it there's a movement away from selfishness there's a movement away from materialist reductionist wanting just there is it's it's interesting and i think it's going to be a powerful change maker mm -hmm. in, in a de in a deed i would argue one of my associates one of my friends um dr uh, penny satori uh wrote a book a few years ago on the transformal transformal transformational effect of the near-death experience well we're all going through effectively something very similar to a near-death experience. Absolutely. I concur. And what happens yeah. with near-death experiences, people change and they see the world in a different way. And I think that's what's going to happen. Oh, my gosh. I you really have, genuinely do. Thank you so much, Mr. Peak. You have just gone right to the core and you have brought up some elements, some that I completely... Um, have crossed my mind. We can talk about Groundhog Day. As a matter of fact, I, I was just saying to a friend the other day, uh, her name is Sahar. I said, Sahar, doesn't it seem like we are living in a veritable Groundhog Day? And she said, Alexis, I said the same thing. But you're bringing up this aspect of remembrance. Now, I use that term a lot. But when I say remember, I say re hyphen member, we're conjoining again, something happening again, but I've never heard it put the way you put it. And I'm going to speak to the audience right now. Is there something about this seemingly unfamiliar experience that paradoxically seems familiar? Stunning, mm, well, Anthony. It does, doesn't it? You just feel, you know, particularly I have a, a group of close friends here um, mm -hmm. and we, we meet on a regular basis. And I, I had a long Skype conversation with one of them today. And we were discussing various things because at the moment I'm, I'm, I'm working with her on, on writing a paper um, and this will ultimately be my, my doctorate. So I'm, I'm oh, in negotiations right. doing a doctorate at the moment. And one of the issues we'd said was, you know, that we're having to rethink and redo the way in which we communicate with Absolutely. people. Suddenly we're communicating in a far deeper way, even though we're not in physical presence of each other. We seem to be talking at a much greater, deeper level of what is exactly happening here because suddenly it's made us think, wow, I'm mortal. In some way, you know, I'm not going to be here forever. I could go out there and I could bump into somebody and they could give me an illness that could kill me. That's right. Now, most of us, we never think about this. Whereas in medieval times, you know, with the Black Death, with the bubonic plague and everything else, people's mortal mortality was there all the time. Death was always evident in people's lives, whereas we are cocooned away from it. And suddenly it's there immediately. And it's making some people think... What's my role in all this? What's my relationship with the environment? 
because we know that the environment itself is 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 burgeoning and, and blossoming because what we are doing is has stopped it's gone into stasis mm -hmm. and suddenly you can hear the birds singing again i mean we live in a quite a country area and to be able to hear the birds again and, and 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 everything else and friends of mine in london are telling me you know you go to parliament hill fields now you can see the city of london quite clearly whereas ordinarily there's always a kind of slight pall of smoke mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. smog over it really really there's something deeply meaningful about this no question. and we're not quite sure what it is but if our daemons they are your game player that's your higher self for want of a better term if our collective higher selves have been through this before maybe that's why there's this feeling of slight optimism because there, it's going to be a huge massive change and it's a tragedy the amount of people that are dying and it is, you know, there's no question about this, but it is of significance. It's going to be the most significant event of our lives and possibly the most significant event of this century. Mm -hmm. And we're living through it. We're witnessing it. Agreed. And yeah, and it's catharsis, isn't it? We're, it's we're certainly in a state of catharsis. Yeah. Again, so much packed into so you're so articulate. I, I just love listening to you. This idea of mortality being in our face. Again, you know, the word that comes to mind, and I think I just said this to a recent guest, the paradox of reality has always fascinated me. And I want to get it, we're going to we're going to segue into your book, because I, I have to tell you something, I don't think you wrote this at this time as an accident, by the way, this is relevant, we're going to segue into this beautifully. But before we do, I want to start by talking about the, the paradox of mortality and immortality. Now, you have a term that you use. I want you to explain to our audience exactly what this is. Damon, you call it Damon Eidolon Dyad. The Damon Eidolon Dyad, yeah. Did, am, did I say that right? <laughs> yeah, Damon Eidolon. They're, Eidolon. they're Greek terms. Okay. Um, I spelled and, it out for uh, myself phonetically, so I, I could try to get close to it. But nonetheless, the, the, the concept behind that is quite fascinating, fascinating in the context of what you're talking about right now, Anthony, in terms of the Damon, one aspect of that uh, understanding what the daemon is, is our Im our immortality. Yes, it's part mm -hmm. of understanding the greater, uh, the greater uh, consciousness of ourselves that is infinite. And yet, I don't know, it's, it's kind of hard to put in terms, but it, it, it seems like that is ignited now along with the more consensual, the understanding of our mortality at this point in time. We're we're living in a sort of dichotomous time where both are coexisting. Mm -hmm. Just comment on maybe explain what say it. You yeah, say it Damon the the Damon Adelon Dyad mm. is something that um, I first came across in my research for my first book, and I expanded in my second book, The Damon or Guide to Your Extraordinary Secret Self. But in simple terms, it's 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 from Gnosticism, mm -hmm. and I think it was very interesting the way you described. Um, the way in which there is part of us that is a part of a greater something, because the the Gnostics would argue that we are we are living within a fabricated universe, a universe created by somebody called Galdaboth, um, the idea of the demiurge, the yes, semi-creator, mm -hmm. and we are trapped within this. Now I'll cite two writers who use this terminology really well. One was um, was William Blake. Yes, my favorite. And my favorite. said that we we are trapped in the, the in our prison and, and everything else as well. He called it the Black Iron Prison, um, and no, he's he called it the Mind Forged Manacles. That is the reality that our perceptions create for us from the external reality, the external stimuli we receive. Because we know, because anybody who reads my books know that I do the hard science. I don't just make these statements. I do the neurology. I do the neuro neurochemistry. But effectively, we know that we are continually internally creating a facsimile, facsimile of the external universe, whatever there is out there, which is probably holographic in nature. But that we are trapped within this and Philip K. Dick, the American science fiction writer that I wrote a biography of a few years ago, mm. called it the, um, the the black iron prison. And again, it's were captured. But there is a part of us, a shard of something that is greater, that is trapped within us. Now, the great Gnostic sages, I, I'm thinking of people like Manny, the, the great Persian sage, 
he argued this, but Gnosticism always argues that there is something inside of us that is part of the greater something. The greater something that's inside of us is called the pleroma. And the pleroma is from the Greek, which means fullness. And that is the real world. It's rather analogous to um, the uh, the analogy of Plato's cave that Plato came up with. The idea that we live in this world of facsimiles. What we think is reality are the shadows on the back of a pe- back of a cave, shadows cast by a fire behind us, and we think those shadows are the reality, but in fact they are just shadows. But there is part of us that knows something greater, mm-hmm. and that shard of reality is what I call the daemon. Now the daemon is. Imagine a scenario. We don't have a great deal of time here. But in my first book, again, I do the science of this from the science of near death experiences and everything else as well. But I argue that at the point of death, human personality splits into two sections, the daemon and the adolon. The daemon is analogous to the sprite you see on a computer screen when you load up a computer game. Every time the game starts, the sprite is recreated with no memories of its past life or anything that it's done before. But every time the game is charged up again, the game player, the daemon, you, your eternal you, remembers what happened the last time you played the game, Mm. last time you lived your life. So it is in a position that it can warn you and it can manipulate you in the same way a game player manipulates the on-screen sprite to make certain decisions to go in certain routes in certain ways because it is trying to get you through the game or it's trying to get you to the point it got you to last time. Now, this is extremely pertinent in terms of what we're living under now because I would imagine that many of us have been preparing for this point because our daemons know about it. Mm -hmm. I know I have personally had this great need to get my ideas out there. I now know why. I now know that the time, as you rightly said before, the time for my work is now. Absolutely. It it couldn't have been at any other time because any other time people wouldn't understand the analogies I use about virtual reality, the way in which you put on a virtual reality headset, an Oculus Rift or anything. You suddenly realize very, very precisely that ex- the external world is as much an hallucination as the hallucination you have when you have a virtual reality headset on. And indeed, hallucinations, we don't, we, you know, you, you speak to any um, scientist dealing with consciousness and dealing with perception will tell you that everything is an hallucination. Technically, everything is an hallucination. Sure. Mm-hmm. So, and people who believe that there's a one-to-one relationship between what is really out there and what your brain is giving you are called naive realists. That's the technical <laughs> term for them. Mm-hmm. So we are suddenly at this wonderful point where we're going to be opening up and we're going to be seeing the universe as it really is. And again, as William Blake said, he said, um, when the doors of perception are cleansed, That's right. we will see reality as it really is, infinite but we are trapped within the within the confines of our cave. And that is so true. We are breaking out of the cave now. We are starting to. And it's going to be a very exciting period. Agreed. Very exciting. One of my favorites, William Blake, and, and uh, there's an allegory that he has that I can't think of the name of it, but the one phrase of it is the universe literally is within a grain of sand. And oh, I love that. Isn't that it, great? It, Tell it, me what... Within the grain of sand. In one of my books, I, I extended that analogy and I yeah. said, and effectively, modern science tells us that the nature of the universe is holographic. Absolutely. And if the nature of the universe is holographic, as was suggested by people like Professor David Bohm, who oh. worked with Einstein <laughs> and everybody <laughs> else, you can imagine the scenario that everything is enfolded in everything else. Well, and as I said in one of my books, this means that the Andromeda galaxy is in your teardrop. Absolutely. Are you reading off of my notes? You're giving me chills here. We were going to talk about Michael Talbot, my absolute favorite oh, book Michael on Talbot, the planet. That book was so influential on me. I have so many copious Absolutely. notes in there. That thing is so dog-eared at this point. But I have to say, and I was going to quote him, and I was going to bring up David Baum and his implicate and explicate order. We're not going to be able to get all this in, but I'm trying Resonation. to try it. <laughs> Resonation. It's resonation. It's what we're doing. But, you know, Michael Talbot, I love quoting him. I love quoting him. I quote him often. He said one of the many things he said, we are like iceberg beings. Most of us is beneath the surface, hidden, mm. right? 
Yeah. Um, and perhaps... it's, it's the way in which, I mean, it's happening now. It's happening now. Yes. It's something, again, that myself and my group say that I call it the egregorial uh, from my new book, the idea that when people who are like-minded or a group of people who are like-minded and think the same way, we create something greater mm -hmm. than what we are. We become something greater. There was a book written many, many years ago called The Mass Psychology of Crowds um, by a French sociologist, because he argued when you get groups of people together in a crowd, there is something greater than they are. Um, so I think it was Le Bon did this, and it means that there's something greater that happens. And when you and I now reacting now, we're creating something far more powerful. Absolutely. And it's what I call the egregorial. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I have two terms. There's the egregore, which are the mind formed entities that seem to be able to come in and out of our reality. But then there's the egregorial, which are which is our collective creation of consensual reality that we see around us. Mm -hmm. It's far more sophisticated than just the 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 the, the, um, the law of attraction. This is this is based again upon. Uh, quantum physics it's based upon the collapse of the wave function it's based upon the twin slit experiment it's based upon observed quantum and what the great great david bohm did as you say with his implicate and explicate orders yes and of course it was david bohm who pointed out that if you break a, a, a holographic image into its bits each image will have a denuded image of the whole that's right. It won't be a part like a jigsaw puzzle. And that is how reality works. And the work that's been done now, Stephen Hawking, in the last paper he ever wrote with a guy called Frank Hartle of CERN, came to the conclusion he called it the top-down hypothesis of quantum physics. And this is the idea that anything that can happen is already encoded digitally Absolutely. within the universe. And of course, this gets into... We, I'm sorry, go ahead. I didn't mean to cut you off. Go and ahead. all we do is we collapse that wave function, which for, which is literally created from our anticipations and that part of the universe is collapses to simulate that which is what happens when you play a computer game mm -hmm. you know the computer game is rendered dependent upon the decisions you make as you move through the game no you know question. this is not an analogy it's far more powerful than that. i agree with you mm -hmm. i was just going to say of course uh, sheldrick's work comes to mind with his uh, mm -hmm. morphogenic fields and i think these are yeah. morphic resonance and i think this is really all perennial you know uh wisdom frankly that's been sort of well again uh, you're quoting here aldous huxley aren't you the perennial <laughs> the, uh, the perennial philosophy the right. idea yeah. that 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 within the within all religions within all, in all spiritual groups there are certain things that are, that are that are taught and one of them is that you know this reality is not as it seems not at all but also the idea of human duality you know from Ju the writings of julian james mm -hmm. as an example you know his bicameral mind work it is evident from split brain operations um, that human personality has many constituent elements. You know, you know, from disassociative personality syndrome, mm. we know that mm. personalities can split. You can split during trauma. I also deal with people, you know, who regularly lucid dream. We were talking about this only this afternoon about lucid dreaming, about out of body experiences, about remote viewing. These things are all reported and the, 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 there's evidence that they're powerful. I work with people who who can, you know, lucid dream, go back to the same place. Yes. Oh, yes. I'm familiar they with that. They meet people, mm -hmm. you know, very, very powerful, very, very powerful stuff. Yeah. I mean, I've the been, thing is, mm -hmm. go on, please. I've been doing that on occasion. I'm trying to I'm trying to get you into, we're obviously going to have to have you back. It, it, it goes without saying there's going to be a, a part two to this because I want you to get into this book and I'm going to I'm going to reiterate this to you Anthony. I am convinced that whether you knew it consciously or not, you prepared to write this book for this time. Let's use that as a segue to get into I want you to give the audience. I know there are quite a few of you out there that are already familiar with Anthony's great work including this book. But give us an overview. I'm, I I tell you what, I'm going to put you on the spot. It let's assume that this book at some level you wrote in preparation for this. What aspect of the hidden universe would you say is most applicable to what we can learn right now with what we've been dealt? Wow, what a question. What a question, Alexis. <laughs> Gotta do it. I um, gotta try. <laughs> I've been thinking long and hard about this as to what 
this or what my writings can teach about the present circumstances. I don't consider myself a teacher. It's, it's a term I, I don't like using because it, it has certain connotations. I tend to con con consider myself to be somebody who is an ordinary Joe who is interested in everything. And therefore, I've been in the fortunate position from my university education and everything else as well to be in a position to, to correlate, bring facts together and sift through facts. And because I have a rather bizarre memory capacity um, in that I tend to if I've tended to if I've read something, I tend to remember it. I don't tend to forget things, which is why people find me a bit weird sometimes in terms of facts and figures, um, which means that I'm in the unique, possibly not unique, but fairly unique position of having read something 15 or 20 years ago and then read something now and make the link. Mm -hmm. And because my reading is so wide from everything from philosophy to to quantum physics to neurology to music to uh rock music to sport i'm interested in absolutely everything musicals i'm interested in in uh, movies and the significance of movies and i think we all what it's telling us if i had to reduce it is that as i said before we have lived this time before that we have this collective memory of this. Now, the collective memory of humanity is what um, Carl Gustav Jung called the collective unconscious. Right. Myself and my associate, Samantha Treasure, who's the, the, the young anthropologist I'm working with at the moment, we're working on the idea of what we call the, um, the uber daemon, which is the collective unconscious of humanity. It is rather like uh, Buck, who was um, a, a, an American philosopher, um, came up with the term the, um, the oceanic effect, the oceanic feeling. And I know that, you know, Michael Talbot mentioned it in terms of we are like icebergs. Mm. But I'd say it's more than that. It's almost like we are waves on an ocean mm. and the waves rise up and each wave is our individual ego. But effectively, we move back into the collective consciousness of humanity. And it is why that is why we have racial memories, why we have memories going back, why if people are hypnotized and they have past life memories, this is what we're attuning into. It's the Akasha. It's the Akashic mm. field. I wrote a book with Irvin Laszlo a few years ago, honing this idea and the Akashic field, the idea of the zero point field, the, the, the digital information field that we all we all come from and all move back into. Because in the final analysis, everything we perceive is pure information. Or as David Bohm would say, as you very wittily said earlier on in something else, information. Mm -hmm. Everything is information. Information, that's and correct. And it's been formed mm -hmm. by consciousness. And there is an argument that the whole reason the universe exists the way it is and the way it's evolved the way it is, it's in order for the universe itself to become self-aware. For the universe itself to be aware of itself in some way. You know, it's almost like the Gaia principle of Lovelock saying the planet itself. But it's greater than that. At its ground state, everything is consciousness. There is no duality. The big question is always duality, you know, matter and mind. The mind creates matter. Right. Not the other way around. Absolutely. Now we're talking about Seth principles, right? <laughs> Consciousness creates reality, not the other way around. Oh my gosh, Anthony Peak, this is a sin and a shame that you've got to hang up so soon <laughs> because there's so much for us to cover. I'm nodding my head voraciously. You can only imagine. You can't see me right now, but yes. And <laughs> you you mentioned the self aware universe. I'm reminded of Goswami's great work, of course. That that mm, uh, yes, by the same name, the title of the book, the self aware universe. So have we answered that question? I mean, I, look, I, I think the inference is there. Everyone has to go out and get this book because I have a feeling you're going to have some epiphanies along the way, journeyers. You're going to know. Do you know, one of the yeah. things that um, I was going to mention before, one of the, things, the most curious things about my writing career is that I use the analogy that I, I do, I, my writing, I am not discover I'm, I'm not discovering i'm excavating hmm. <laughs> and i use the analogy in the past i'm like frederick schleeman when he was discovering troy 
you know, he he realized that, you know, the, the myth of Troy, was it a myth? Was it actual history? And he discovered a hill called Hisseluk in northern Turkey. And he just sensed that there was something special about this place. And he started digging. And as he started digging, he started to discover different cities and different layers of the historical cities of Troy. I feel that this is what's been happening with my writing. I've been excavating it. The information is already there. And, I, and what was happening was my daemon has been guiding me for most of my life in terms of this. There's some uncanny things that happen where my daemon leaves me clues from my own past mm. in my future. It, it is it is bizarre. And we'll get into these things uh, in due course because I think we need far longer. I do. Because too. you and I are obviously think in a very similar way absolutely and it's like to talk to somebody that immediately gets it you know gets it in the in the in the subtle levels as well not just the surface levels the the whole again i say paradox of reality subtle but profound that's a cliche of course and yet it is so incredibly true excuse me um the the nuances in those whispers if you will that only can be retrieved in solitude. As you know, I live in uh, New England. I'm not going to say the actual town, but you know where I am. Uh, I'm in the presence of the spirits of Thoreau and Emerson. And so I have been bred on the act of contemplation. It's not a passive act, people. It's a very, very important act. You obviously, you're an expert contemplator for sure, Anthony. You and I, I think, are cut from the same cloth, I have a feeling. That was pure so. poetry, by the way, the way you described <laughs> that was pure poetry. But and it's true. People like Emerson would have loved that, because one of the things <laughs> when I visited New England, the, those guys were doing some fascinating work. They sure were. You know, and yeah. they should be known more. You know, again, people like Thomas Merton and people like that as well, you know, the real great thinkers that were thinking deeply, very deeply about exactly what the human condition is and again i think in answer to your question earlier i think this is what is going to happen now i was just going to say we're going to start looking inwards we're going to start looking to find find the god within to find the something to find our shard inside in a way that we can help humanity collectively move move away from this need to own things into a far more open collective occurring world and you know we we have to do this we can't continue like this we can't continue being separate i don't think we will universe has stepped in anthony i'm convinced of this regardless of the surface impetus i have always said i say always in the last six weeks let's say this is an invitation to discover the magic within the madness and I think it's an ultimatum at the same time. So here have we you, go. You, have, you, have you managed to actually get some of your, your wonderful quotes written down? Because of they seem to uh, yes. spontaneously come out of you and they're just brilliant. <laughs> it's just brilliant. I think you're you know. triggering me, my friend. You're the triggering sheer me. alliteration, though. Was it, your alliteration, though, was incredible. You know, oh, incredible. It takes one to know one. Well, listen, we're going to wrap up because I, I'm watching the clock for you. This is a busy man, everyone. So I'm going to give you the – unless there's – let me say this. Do you have a closing thought before I give you a little plug on where you can find this book and your wonderful website? What would you like to say in closing? Uh, I would just like to say that um, it's a wonderful opportunity talking to you because it gives more people the opportunity to join what is what is a worldwide movement now. There are so many people involved in my work that it's sometimes humbling the people share the information they do with me and we're we're all friends we're all a group yes. we're all trying to make changes without being crazy you know i, I know it's a well known statement but i use the statement because i think it's very true that it's good to have an open mind but don't keep your open mind so much that your brain falls out i love it there is enough <laughs> fascination and wonderment in the universe as it is given to us by our modern understanding of science and within science and as science expands we will find the wonders and we will open the doors of perception as aldous huxley said of course one of my books my previous book was called um um 
God, I've forgotten it. God, it's been a long day. Uh, opening the doors of perception. There you go. Because again, Aldous Huxley was somebody that was that was huge influence upon me. Yeah. And it's just with the opportunity to just speak to your 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 listeners and your viewers as well. So join me. Um, the website is anthonypeak.com. Um, I'm very, very active on Facebook. You'll find me under Anthony Peak. Also, I'm more and more active now on Instagram as Cheat Oh, great. The we'll have to link Cheat. up there. Okay, Excellent. I'm Cheat the Ferryman 54. The overall concept that I have that you live your life again and again and again, but mm. you have the opportunity to change it is called Cheating the Ferryman. And we haven't even touched upon the ancient Greek background to that and how the great ancient Greek philosophers. Uh, and interestingly enough, um, towards the end of this week, I'll be having my uh, two of my books are due to come out in Greek um, Fantastic. later this year. And Greece is a country I love. So I'm planning to go over there together with a group of associates where we're going to be recreating Plato's cave in the cave that Plato, that the people, the academics believe that Plato actually brought forward his idea of Plato's cave. And we're going to reproduce it there. Um, so that's going to be a very exciting event. That Amazing. could be world changing if we can get more people aware of what we're going to be doing, because that's going to be making people really, really think objectively about what perception is. And we need that right now. We do. We need that we right now. Everyone, I want you to go to anthonypeak.com. Of course, we're going to have a link for you. I think I may list all of your books. I'm going <laughs> to list them all. But the one that you need to get go, right go now, <laughs> the one you need to get right now is The Hidden Universe and Investigation into Non-Human Intelligences, plural. And uh, we've got a lot more to talk about, my friend. And I'm going to call you that because I have a feeling that we are long lost friends. <laughs> I think so, too. I think so, too. Absolutely. Oh, my goodness. Wonderful to speak to you. Likewise. Now, don't hang up. I want to say a proper goodbye, but I'm going to sign off with the journeyers for now. And before we do, I want to ask you, would you come back real soon? Because there's a lot we've left off the table. I, I can I can come back within a week, you know, a few days. It doesn't matter. Okay. I can do it. We're going to do it. Count on it. But in the meantime, digest. Anthony said a lot. So you've got time to digest a, a bit before we come back for part two. So I want to say thank you again, Anthony. And thank you, journeyers. I always appreciate you. I love you. Stay well, stay safe, and stay beautiful. Take good care. Mm -hmm.